great. Thank you, um, everybody. Um, so, um, um, well, this is a singular moment in, in, in our field. And, uh, um, um, you know, as you, as you imagine, the, uh, you know, the two most important things that, that will determine the success of our endeavor are uh, having, the, having the right kind of hardware, building scalable, uh, uh, scalable quantum computers, for which we've had you know, a lot of success of late, and, and there are plenty of resources around. And the second uh, important thing is algorithms. Um, so in, in terms of um, designing algorithms, the, the, the standard question one asks is, um, can a quantum computer perform a given task faster than classical computers? And the two biggest uh, examples of this that, that we have you know, follow this paradigm. Factoring, there's quantum simulation. In both these cases, there's an exponential speed up. These are existing problems for which there's an exponential speed up over the best classical algorithm. So then, um, you know, the, the, the key question that we really need to answer for, you know, for our enterprise is what, what other computational tasks can be sped up? And of course, one, one, can, one has to ask the question, well, if, if uh, uh, you know, on what kind of quantum computer, NISC or, or eventually a scalable fault-tolerant quantum computer. And for, for the purposes of this talk, I won't, I won't really draw a distinction. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that. And the answer to this, you know, this is not an easy question to answer. And um, somehow, uh, you know, to, to answer it or to even, even start answering it in a meaningful way, I think one really needs to go back and look at, um, look at um, why quantum, you know, what is it about quantum computers that makes them so powerful or what's so unique about them? And so let me, let me just review that so that, um, you know, so that we have that in mind when we come back to this, this question. So uh, in, in, in a sense, um, you know, if we, if we go back to Newton, um, already starting with him and then gaining, after that was, was this notion of a mechanical universe, or sometimes also called a clockwork universe. And um, um, it was, um, you know, our entire conception of computers before quantum computers actually rested on this view, view of, uh, uh, of the world. So in what sense do, do I mean this? Well, in the sense that Actually, you know, once, once you go on from Newton eventually to Maxwell, uh, you know, there was this notion that you can describe nature by local differential equations, so in the classical world. And once you assume space and time are discrete, that, that sort of means that nature is sort of like a, class, a cellular automaton. Uh, this particular uh, cellular automaton is the game of life uh, um, by uh, John Conway. Um, and in a sense, you know, the, the fact that our entire model of computation relied on this, actually, in, in, in complexity theory, this is, this is known as, as something called the extended chair string thesis, which says, look, once our, once our model of computation relies on this view of the universe, we, we really understand computation, you know, we, we understand what, what the limits of our computers look like. All we have to do is increase the clock speed and increase the amount of memory. Those are, those are really the kinds of variables we can optimize. And, and of course, the, the, the difference from quantum, you know, is that once you move to quantum mechanics, what you see is not what you get. If you have n particles, then how they behave depends upon, you know, this exponentially large shadow in the background in, in, an, in, a, in this exponential dimensional Hilbert space. So something's going on that we cannot see. And this Hilbert space is exponentially large. And so even if you have n particles, describing them requires an exponential amount of in information. So this, is, this, is, this is sort of the really weird uh, you know, uh, place that quantum computing starts from. And of course, every time you, you, you do an operation, this, this entire state sort of changes, which means that 
nature behind the scenes is doing an exponential amount of work. Also, there's this other aspect of it that when we go to look at the answer, we only get a small amount of information, at most n bits. And so this is called the data bottleneck. So there's this enormous amount of work being done behind the scenes. We don't, we don't know where. And we as classical beings get to interact with this enormous source of uh, computation through this tiny bottleneck. Um, this is what, um, of course, Feynman was referring to in his famous paper from 1981, um, where he said, apparently, if you want, want to simulate quantum mechanics, we need these exponential resources. This is the, this is the quantum simulation problem that's, that uh, quantum computers can do. So any asks, is this inherent, or is it possible that there are different, there's a different description of quantum systems that can be efficiently simulated? So we know the answer to that. But you know, at the time, Feynman's paper was largely forgotten for about a decade. And then it was, it was discovered, and, 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 and it was shown that, in fact, quantum computers are a robust model of computation. They provide exponential speedups for some challenge problems. And therefore, this shook up the foundations of computer science. It also eventually led to Shor's famous quantum factoring algorithm, which, which made it clear that this is also of great practical importance. Now, the significance of this new computational model well, went well beyond promising faster computers. You know, it's, it's a new worldview, just like the mechanical universe. It's a way to look, you know, a computation is not just about, about building computers, it's, it's a way we look at the world. And over the years, especially in the last decade or two, this has had a profound effect on many, many areas, including areas of physics, like condensed matter physics, quantum gravity. Of course, it has radically changed cryptography. It's, you know, it's had, it's had a profound effect even bef before quantum computers uh, come to exist. Now, I want to say all this because, one, it, it gives us a grounding in terms of understanding some of the challenges, but it also sort of re reminds us that this is a model of, you know, of computation that's so strange that maybe we should, you know, we should be asking different kinds of questions about it. Okay, there was, there was one other question that in those early days we asked, which is, we said, well, um, for, for example, one might naively argue that it's impossible to experimentally verify this exponentially large Hilbert space, but then, if you were to do an experiment demonstrating an exponential speed up, that would, that would do it. And in fact, such an experiment was done a couple of years ago. This was the Google, Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment. And this is, you know, this was, again, you know, to, to emphasize the, the importance of all this, I think this was a really important scientific experiment. It's, um, this is because this exponential growth of, of, uh, of, of this Hilbert space is, a, is one of the most counterintuitive aspects of quantum mechanics. And these quantum supremacy experiments actually go towards establishing this. Now, why is it not a one and done experiment? Because we have to make sure that there are no loopholes. And in fact, very recently, last month, there was a, there was a paper that was uh, from, uh, from USTC um, showing that you can classically spoof uh, Google's experiment. Now, they actually did the experiment over, over you know, this spoofing over a period of weeks, but they actually also did calculations showing that if you use the right kind of supercomputer, it would just take a few seconds. Um, they also did a different kind of uh, a quantum supremacy experiment based on boson sampling. But then this time Google returned the, the favor by showing that there's a classical spoofing uh, algorithm for the Bose, boson sampling experiment. And so this, you know, uh, quantum supremacy is really not yet done. And, you know, uh, I, I would expect it to ricochet back and forth over the next many years. Of course, at the same time, quantum supremacy was a very interesting experiment from the point of view of actually implementing quantum computers and realizing, uh, you know, quantum, quantum computers and, and actual quantum uh, 
algorithms and app applications. So it's a step along the way. Now, one, one can also sort of say, um, well, what, what could these, you know, what, are there any practical consequences to these quantum supremacy experiments? And in the, I, I think uh, already many of you have probably heard about uh, uh, Scott Aronson's results showing that you can, you can sort of build a certifiable quantum random number on, uh, on it. There was also a recent, uh, very recent result showing that there's another task you can carry out using, using these kinds of uh, tools that have been built up in, in the process of uh, quantum supremacy. And that's benchmarking. Now, benchmarking is one of the very important things one wants to do in order to both uh, un, you know, characterize the, the, the quantum computer that's been implemented so that one can improve upon it. And um, one of the major issues in, in benchmarking is, is crosstalk or correlated errors. So randomized benchmarking can only get you, get you individual errors on individual qubits. So there, there's this recent paper that's, that gives an algorithm based on Google's experiment of random circuit sampling. So it, it implements something like random circuit sampling. And it shows that the, that the measure that Google used, which was, which was uh, linear cross entropy, this can be used to infer the total error in that quantum circuit. Now, once you're armed with this, you can actually give formal evidence for for one of the claims that Google made in, that, in their paper, which is that they could, they could actually understand the noise, not just the amount of noise, but actually the actual noise model for their, for their device. And the fact that you know, their observations uh, seem to show that the noise was uncorrelated noise on the, on the different qubits. Now, this, this, this particular algorithm just gives a more formal basis for that. OK. so. Now, let, let me just say that there, there are, you know, this, this notion that, uh, that um, you know, that, that um, um, we have this, this quantum computer, which is, which is an access to this exponentially large Hilbert space, but then we are classical beings interacting with it. You know, this notion that, that, that we get to interact with something that's incredibly powerful. Um, this sort of suggests that one way to think about your quantum computation is as an interaction between a classical, um, classical uh, being and, and, and this, uh, and this exponential, exponentially powerful uh, sort of oracle. And so there's been, there's been this, you know, a sequence of works that, that, that sort of um, um, exploit this viewpoint or, you know, or you know, go along this direction to see what can you do once you have these kinds of interactions, and what 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 do these these uh, um, these devices actually allow you to do? So there are there are various things you can do. There are there are these protocols that are based on post quantum cryptography that allow you to do um, this kind of quantum supremacy experiments. Except now you can you can you can do them efficiently uh, in a, in a in a provable way. Um, or certified random number generation. Now these are in principle um, uh, protocols, but recently there was there was a proof of principle demonstration on an iron trap quantum computer in Maryland. Not to not not a large enough demonstration to to actually show quantum supremacy, but still a proof of concept showing that that if one could scale up the size of the uh, the, the number of qubits sufficiently and the error rates down sufficiently, then one, one could actually use these kinds of protocols um, uh, to, to, uh, to perform these tasks. These kinds of ideas have also been used to do really very interesting, you know, much more you know, sort of tasks that one wouldn't have believed possible, such as uh, ver verification that the output of a quantum computer, which is, you know, which is exponentially hard to compute. So you know, it, it comes back and tells us an answer uh, 47. How do we know it's the correct answer? Right? And, and so Urmila Mahathir's protocol actually does this. And it also, there's also a protocol to, to delegate quantum computation in a, 
uh, to, to a quantum computer on the cloud in a, in a manner where the computation stays secure. This kind of uh, interactive picture also shows up in, in a different context in, in, this, um, in this work on, uh, on classical shadows. Um, uh, this, this work was, um, was inspired by earlier work of Scott Aronson on uh, shadow tomography. And um, um, this, this has been done by um, Robert Huang and uh, John Preskill and their, and their group. So, so the, the issue here is this, that, um, that um, if you want to try to understand what quantum state is in, in, our, in our quantum memory, well, if you, if you really want to do full tomography, it'll take you an exponential amount of time and an exponential number, number of measurements. And so this makes it very hard to deal with this. this uh, you know, it, it, makes it, it makes it hard to interact with this, uh, uh, this, this quantum computer. And so these classical shadows are actually efficient classical sketches of, of that quantum state uh, that are created by measuring the quantum state in, in a random basis. Could be in a random Clifford basis, for example. Now, now, the point of these measurements is that they can later be used to estimate observa observables of, of that given state. So in a sense, the sketch can be now used later in, you know, to, to do what you want. So what, what they actually proposed was an algorithm that uses these classical shadows as training data for a classical machine learn algorithm. Um, and so, so you go back and forth between, between your quantum computer, but you use these classical shadows to sort of steer the quantum computer in the directions it should, it should go in. And you know, to, for example, predict the properties of, of, of quantum system. Now, uh, Okay, so um, now I, I spoke about this data bottleneck in in uh, in quantum computers in um, in in um, uh, communicating with a quantum computer, and um, so how does this affect uh, actually more conventional uh, computational problems? So in a in a standard computational problem you would expect to have large amounts of data uh, to be fed into the computer. Whereas for the foreseeable future, we'll have only a small number of qubits in our quantum computer. And so there's a first step that we have to do before we can even get started on our, on our quantum comp computation, which is using classical techniques for sketching. So you take your computational problem and you and you distill it down into a small core of a problem. And then once you have this small core problem, then you focus on that and you use your quantum computer to actually solve that problem. So what this, what this means is that the, the, the problem that you start from and the problem that you might want to solve on the quantum computer might look very different from each other. Eventually, if you, if you do succeed in, in solving that core problem on the quantum computer, then you, you can efficiently take that core solution and, and expand it into a solution to the, to the original problem. So these two, two uh, steps, you know, the compression and then the expansion of the solution, that uh, compression of the problem and expansion of the solution, these are sort of classical, but, the, but this core problem is, is quantum. So, um, So now, com coming back to, to, to this, uh, this model that we have of a, of a classical computer interacting with this, with this very interesting, uh, you know, radical new, new, new model of computation. So the first thing is that, well, quantum algorithms are, are as important to the success of our enterprise as scaling up quantum computer. You know, the, these two things must go hand in hand. There's, there's been intense work on this over the last few years. You know, there's, there, are, there are many new things that have been developed. Uh, there's one technique in particular, which is called quantum signal processing, which has led to 
improvements in many tasks, including, including quantum simulation, linear algebra, quantum algorithms for linear algebra. In fact, it leads to so, some sort of you know, optimal parameters for, for a whole slew of problems. And um, it, it also has led to um, better bounds for, for quantum simulation for certain challenge problems, uh, such as Fomoko, uh, you know, so, uh, cha challenge problems in quantum chemistry. But the, the main thing I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to say here is, is, is the following, that um, focusing our attention on standard computational problems, such as, um, such as optimization problems, or on, on applications that, that, we, you know, that we currently have for classical computers, this may be too narrow for, um, you know, for, the, for the new tools that we have. And this is because you know, this, this model of comput computing is so different from anything that we've seen before, where you know, models of comput computing that were based on this mechanical universe model, you know, view of, 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 the, of the universe. Where, so, so the difference here is that, is that we are trying to, to, um, to control um, a computation that's happening behind the scenes that we have, we have not only very little, um, um, you know, we, we, we have very few resources to communicate with that process because, because of this data bottleneck, but, but, but also that communication, that small amount of com communication also has to satisfy um, various constraints imposed upon it by, by quantum mechanics. And so coming at these problems from the viewpoint of saying, look, here are the problems that we, that we, that we formulated for in our classical world. Here are the problems that, that um, um, here are the applications that we had, uh, that we have developed based on our interactions, based on the fact that we had classical computers for, for the last uh, over half a century. Um, you know, it would be too much of a coincidence that these problems would be solved readily by, you know, would be the, would be the best problems to solve on a classical computer. Uh, we should think of it as a, as a grand coincidence that, that factoring had an efficient uh, quantum, uh, uh, quantum algorithm. And, and I, th I think that, um, you know, there, there, are, there are obviously, you know, there are, there are, there are intense efforts to try to solve these stan standard problems and great progress is being made there. But, but I think that a lot more of our energy should go towards looking at, you know, starting from the other end and seeing what, you know, what is it that quantum computers are good at and what can they, what can they naturally do? And what, what uh, you know, the way we can think, think about it, the way I'd, I'd like to think about it is that just as we have co-evolved with our, with our tools in terms of classical computation, and many of the problems we, that we think of as fundamental and natural and important are the ones that we, we've arrived at through this process of co-evolution for, for um, well over 50 years, 70, 80 years. That, that we are the start of such a process of co-evolution with, with, with these, this, this new, uh, you know, this new tool that we have at our, uh, you know, that, that we will soon have at our command. And um, this, this is really what, you know, the, the thought that I want to, would, would like to leave you with, that this is a process that we should really embrace and try to follow. Thank you. Uh, any questions? You have a, you have some questions, yeah. So please please wait for the mic. Okay. Um, so I was really interested in in the data bottleneck and your description of that. Um, and you know, of course, it's similar to what we have in experimental physics, where 
um, you know, we have a really complicated system and do something like, you know, measure a dissociation energy or an excitation energy or something like that. Um, and it also strikes me that at least in chemistry, a lot of the things that, um, that we access experimentally are also things that we have good uh, computational approximations for, right? A bond dissociation, you know, you know a, a, a ground state calculation, um, you're more likely to think we'll have a good um, polynomial approximation than something like some bizarre excited state mm. uh, potential energy surface. Um, and, and what I was wondering is, um, does that provide a particular challenge for quantum algorithms? Uh, because the things that, that, that we can readily access experimentally might also be computationally tractable. Um, so that that kind of pushes the, you know, where, where you might have a meaningful computational advantage using a quantum processor into regimes that we don't often access experimentally. Mm. So, um, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's really, really interesting. So I, I guess the, you know, I'll, I'll just try to make sense of it, this because um, um, I'm, I'm unclear whether, whether it's just the experiments that don't access, access uh, other, other data or it's even that everything we perceive about that, about that particular setup doesn't access any, any other data because if, if nothing we perceive accesses that, that other information, then maybe we don't even need to compute it at all. Um, but um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean, well, it's actually relevant to us physically because it does make a difference, but we just don't have a way of proving it experimentally. And then, then of course, that, that's, a, that's a very, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, uh, that's a very interesting situation where maybe quantum computers would be useful. I, I should also come back and say one, one other thing here, which is, you know, I, I, I referred to quantum simulation as, as something that, um, um, as an example of a problem, existing problem that was, for which there was a speed up. But, you know, if you, I, at least from my, my viewpoint, if you look at it naively, you, I, I would say, well, look, um, you know, I, I don't know that physicists actually thought about computation uh, of uh, uh, simulation that way, you know, because, Many, many times when physicists are interested in quantum simulation, they are interested in understanding the ground state or understanding particular states. And so, so it's not clear to me, you know, given that they didn't have the tools to actually study the dynamics, which is what quantum simulation does with, uh, gives you with uh, quantum computers. So in that, in, in that sense, maybe this, is, this was also not a, not a problem that, you know, solving a, a, an existing problem, but you know, solving a cousin of an existing, pro existing problem. Quantum computers are basically noisy systems. So I was wondering whether they're suited for analyzing simulation of noise and how the evolution of noise. Oh, I see. I, you know, I, I, uh, I you know, I think that, um, at least the way the way we think about uh, quant quantum computing, we 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 are, we are always trying to control the noise and uh, and um, uh, you know try to make them as fault tolerant as possible. But of course, in order to in order to get to those uh, to fault tolerant uh, quantum computers, we we are going to have to understand that noise, and this is where benchmarking of the noise comes in. And so, in that sense, um, um, you know. It, it should be, the, you know, it's, it's probably going to be the case that, that um, you know, this, this whole endeavor of building quantum computers will lead to a much better understanding of, of noise in quantum systems, uh, you know, much more detailed view of it than one, one may have had before. Yes. Um, yeah, you could, you could consider that, a, you know, a, a side effect of, of quantum computers. All right, thank you very much, Umas. Thank you.